They could be at desks in Hartford, Connecticut, Des Moines, Iowa, or Portland, Oregon. These people are in Atlanta, Georgia. 23rd floor, underwriting department, Life of Georgia, an insurance company. It's Monday morning, 7.45 a.m. The workday is beginning. Once, to be a white collar worker was to be an aristocrat of the labor force. They worked with their heads, not their hands. You could pick them out by their clean fingernails. But work in America has come to mean an office, not a factory. Most of the work of America is done in offices now. 40 million of us work in offices. 59 people work here. They spend eight hours a day here in the underwriting department. Half their adult lives. What they do here is decide whether the company should accept the insurance policies its agents sell. Jim York, senior underwriter. He worked in a Mr. Donut shop. He likes wearing a suit and tie to work now. Winnie Bray, underwriter. She left college when she got married. This is her first job. She's been here five years. For her, the job means independence. Gerald Paget is the boss. He has his own office, his own telephone, a Monet print on the wall. They believe in work, but most of them didn't choose the work they're doing. Many of them make less money than blue collar workers, but most of them would not want to be blue collar workers. They work at this job because it's clean, comfortable, and secure. <laughs> they have no union, but they have medical insurance, work a four and a half day week. They have a company cafeteria where they can get lunch at half price. Almost no one gets fired, and they retire on a pension at 65. Sam Thompson, the assistant manager. He came here in 1946. He was 20 years old. He'll retire in 1991. What are you going to do between now and 1991? Just working a day at a time, trying to take it a day at a time. That's what I try to live by right here. To not live tomorrow, not live yesterday, but just today. So another week begins at the office, in the underwriting department, on the 23rd floor at Life of Georgia. Form 727 from Jim Kitchens. Jim Kitchens has been a trainee in the underwriting department at Life of Georgia for six months. That's all. When he was in college, he thought he'd like to be a doctor. Joe Chatham is Jim Kitchens' boss, chief underwriter for health insurance. In college, they told him he had an aptitude for science. He's been at Life of Georgia for 16 years. Tommy Rowe is another trainee. He wanted to be a social worker. But when he got out of the army, he needed a job. He's been here five months. He respects Joe Chatham, but he'd like to be higher up in the company when he's Joe Chatham's age. How old are you, Joe? I'm 38. You retire at 65? At 65. This is the only place Joe Chatham has ever worked. When he retires in 27 years, he'll get a pension that's 57% of the salary he's been making. I think so. Looks like it. Did. You didn't pick it at the first time? No. Jim Kitchens makes $6,900 a year. When he becomes an underwriter, he may make between $9,000 and $12,000 a year. That's okay. Thank One you. reason he did not go to medical school was that he and his girl, whom he met in high school, decided to get married. He quit college and went looking for a job. 
He found one at Life of Georgia. Joe Chatham sees in Jim Kitchens himself almost two decades ago. My wife's name is Barbara. We met in high school. We married when I was a senior in college. What happened to me then was that about a year and a half later, we had twins. The money that, that other couples might have used at that point to, to have, you know, new cars and better places to live. We had to use it for other purposes, but we got by. And I thought at one time that I would like to just give it all up and go to medical school, but there again, I guess the matter of security came in and I had a family and I just couldn't give it up. Spending his life here is one of the things that worries Jim Kitchens. In his desk is a medical book he reads when he gets a chance. He plans to find a way to get a college degree. It would be at night, two nights a week. It takes a little longer that way, but uh, it can be done. Joe Chatham did it. Tommy Rowe finished college, got his degree in art education. You're the first black male underwriter in this department. Right. How did you feel when you first came in? Well, actually, I didn't look at myself in that, in that way. I, in fact, I just felt like another person doing the job that I'm told and just being a regular member of the crowd. Being black, do you feel there as many opportunities open to you? Well, truthful, I'd have to say no. The, the immediate impression I got as soon as I walked in the door of Life of George is that we have a lot of, there are a lot of black people here that they are all clerical or uh, messenger type people. I mean, I, uh, my outlook on it is just that if, I, if I'm good enough, I can make it. But deep down inside, I know that there'll still be the inner feelings among other people, and uh, people just don't change that quickly. You guys are ready for a coffee break? Yeah, let's go. Okay. What was your attitude about blacks before you came to work here? I'll be honest with you, I never thought about it. I didn't know any of them. <clears throat> My only contact with a, with a black person was a maid we had when I was little, whom I just loved. And so, when Tommy came, I was a little bit afraid of what would happen, how to talk to them, how, what, what would we talk about. When I first got here, Jim was about the first person uh, I met, and right from then on, we, we just stuck together because we realized that we were in the same, I see it ended in the same situation. We were both underwriting trainees, and we started relying on each other for, you know, support. He's really the first black person I've ever had much to do with. And I think, all right, Friday, for instance, was the first day that he and I have ever eaten lunch together. The funniest one was we decided we'd have fried chicken. And the lady there asked uh, to uh, white meat or dark meat, and he said white meat, and I said dark meat, and he just went haywire. He thought that was the funniest thing in the world. I don't think we would ever be bosom buddies, but we, I think we care how the other one is. The person in the department Jim Kitchens and Tommy Rowe admire most and are most puzzled by is their boss, Joe Chatham. He knows more about underwriting and the underwriting business and insurance than probably anyone in the department. Really a good person. I mean, he's the kind of person who says he's a Christian and he proves it day by day uh, in the things that he does. He's very dedicated. He holds it together. Joe, as you look back, how do you feel about your past achievements in the company? Well, I guess generally I would say that I would have hoped to have been a little more successful at this point, but I guess I could have done worse. I feel sorry for Joe and the fact that maybe he hasn't pushed himself hard enough to get ahead. I guess he lacks a little bit of drive, but uh, yeah. I guess that's what makes him so sad. Thank you, boy. At 4.30, this workday is over for Jim Kitchens and Tommy Rowe. Bye, Joe.
They work for eight hours together. They will separate when they leave the building. He comes from the richest section in Atlanta. And the place where I live is one of the poorest. But I live within a section they call the Summer Hill section. And um, it's a section that is supposedly real high in crime and a lot of violence. But I haven't seen that many instances of it since I've been out there. Of the people you will meet at Life of Georgia, Tommy Rowe is one of the few who lives in Atlanta. I live right across the express from the public stadium. Most who work here live in the suburbs. The suburbs are safe, clean, and white. Her name is Emily O'Haran Kitchens. Okay. She's very set on having children and being a housewife. Okay. My wife's name is Patricia, and she's a school okay. teacher. How's the day? Mm -hmm. Okay. It's good. How is your day, my man? Being married, I'm pretty sure, uh, like everybody else, I want, well, first of all, I want security and the jo any job that I have. I want to get the best type of home for my family. But I hope that he uh, does better and has more than I had when I came up. And I, well, most of all, I want him to be a man. Uh, we can deduct a certain percentage on list. Uh, we're obviously not ready for children yet. I don't think we're, either one of us are mature enough to, to start raising them. We gotta raise ourselves first. I figure in, uh, financially in about two years I can start marketing around for a, a small, you know, moderate house. And deduct all of it? Okay. Joe Chatham lives here in this house where he's lived for 14 years. Patty, do you have a Girl Scout meeting? He's thought about adding to the house, but he hasn't done it. He's thought about moving, but he hasn't done it. I have the same problems, I guess, that most people in my bracket have. I can recall when I first started to work, where I work now, that. Uh, I would have thought at that time that anybody who made the salary that I make now would be on easy street. But uh, with inflation and so forth, it's just not that way. I'm still a little bit toying with the idea of going on and studying medicine. But it, it would be a long, hard road, and I'd like to go ahead and start a family and things like that. And it would be very impractical, really, to subject my wife to the about a year and a half left of college, plus four years of medical school, then interning residency, and then opening the practice. By that time, we'd, we'd both be, <laughs> I guess you'd be a little bit defeated in the, in the whole thing. I believe that I get more satisfaction from the work I do in the church than I do perhaps from my job. Now, maybe I would have thought when I was first getting started that by this time I would, would have more than I have. But I can also say that if you can't have everything you want and you can't be happy without everything you want, then you're a pretty miserable individual. I will retire January 1st, 2001. Whatever I've done, good or bad, has just about been done by now. 
It's just a matter of wondering how it will turn out. Of the 59 people in the underwriting department at Life of Georgia, 38 are women. Most are typists and clerks. Mary Benz is an underwriter. Mary, now that you're an underwriter, what do you see in your future? Really not much, because all the senior underwriters have been with the company a long time, and they are men. Do you think that men advance more readily than women? Yes. Mary, would you mind checking this Okay. Mary Benz has been at Life of Georgia for 17 years. She's now an underwriter for health insurance policies under $5,000. If there were an opening for a senior underwriter, would a man be considered before a woman? Yes, I think so, because I feel like that the men get the better position. Recently, they have opened or made the position of general supervisor, but, uh, of course, that was given to Les Chesson, which had only been with the company a short while. Okay. Okay. I would have liked the position to have been discussed with me. And then, if the salary had have been more than what I'm making, or I would have had a better chance for advancement, then I would have liked the position. And I think with 17 years of service, I should have been considered. Liz, would you put this postponed on the terminal for me? Okay. Les Chesser, who got the job Mary Benz wanted, is 28. He's been at Life of Georgia for four years. We have two female supervisors in our department, but they're sort of lax and they can't control the people they have now. So as far as putting over a larger group of people, they knew they couldn't handle it. So I think they looked to a man in this respect, I've heard that a woman will work better for a man. I don't know if that's true or not. Joyce, why did you give up your job as supervisor? I felt I couldn't handle the job. I felt that the girls needed a man supervisor where there wouldn't be so much jealousy. And the girls seemed to be in a position where I could hurt their feelings too easy. And I didn't want this to happen. I would be proud to have a woman as the manager on my floor. I think it would be great. Diane Thomas, who processes new business. There's just no way. Just take Les, for instance. He, he doesn't know any more than anybody else does. That's the whole thing. The thing is, he's a man. Les Chesser supervises 33 people. They all happen to be women. But we are trying to change this at the present. We're looking into a few men to handle some of the clerical positions around here. We call it clerical session now, clerical jobs, because of the women's liberation. We can't call them women's jobs anymore. They come to me with their family problems, their sex problems, uh, work problems, anything in general, really. One of my girls comes to me, and she tells me who she's been out with the night before and what they did in detail. What is your policy about dating girls in the office? <laughs> well, my policy is I don't date girls in life of Georgia. I did this in Macon, where I worked before, and it didn't work out. It was They came back the next day and talked about everything we did, so I didn't like it. <laughs> I think basically in this company, dating between singles is frowned upon as far as management is concerned, unless it's done outside the company, period. If you go with somebody, a lot of times, like, they won't have break or lunch. And if they have lunch with the person they're dating, they go outside the building to do it. And that's ridiculous. <laughs> you know, you can see somebody and be in love with them in the evenings, but you can't be in love with them at work. They don't like for us to stay on the phone. They say we uh, abuse our lounge privileges. We congregate and talk too much. 
Uh, I feel like I'm treated like I'm in kindergarten. I'm 27 years old, and I don't think I need to raise my hand to come into the lounge. And uh, I could get fired for saying this, but uh, I'll have to live with that. Diane Thomas is one of the angry women on the 23rd floor. Others are not. Okay. My goodness, what's going on here? Thank you very much. I wasn't expecting this. In fact, at my age, you don't really remember these things so well. Try to forget them. This is one of the things Joyce Palmer likes about working at Life of Georgia. It's Joe Chatham's birthday. Usually one of the girls makes the cake for us, or if maybe whoever uh, volunteers to get the cake, maybe they might buy it instead of making it. But it's usually a very nice thing that happens. It's uh, pleasant. You're very nice to remember. Everybody's invited to have some on break. <laughs> Pat Gilman, she's supervisor of the new business section. I've never worked in any other department, but uh, I don't believe I'd care to. Uh, the, uh, the people here, are, it's just like um, a big happy family, and that's the way most of us get along. If uh, we want to have the day off to go shopping, we can take and put a memo down and say, we'd like to request this day off for personal day. And we have three personal days that we can take in half days, in hours, until we use all that time up just for our personal use. Most of the women who work on the 23rd floor say they like the work they do and the company they work for. They do not feel they have the same chance as men in their jobs. Many of them are not sure they want the same chance. But relations between men and women at the office are changing. I think several years ago, women came into our office with a different uh, idea and a different expectation entirely than they do now. Uh, many of them came in thinking that they would work till they got married, and we employed them with that uh, in mind, really, with that expectation. But that isn't the situation anymore. Despite the changing atmosphere, most women in this office think of a career as second to having a home and a family. They think of their jobs in terms of security, not status. They plan to work until they get married, or to supplement their husband's income, or because life as a housewife and mother has become boring to them. How do you see your future in this company? I feel I'll work here two or three more years at least. Being a new mother, there's always added expenses, which we'll always have to meet. And with the new cost of living, it's just impossible right now to quit. Well, we could live without me having to work, modestly, of course, but we wouldn't starve to death. But I'd rather work than stay at home. Linda Cooper, who supervises four typists. She's single. She lives with her mother. She has one year of college. Would you say that you were ambitious? Um... Yes, I'd say I'm ambitious. When I um, first made me supervisor, I was accused of being ambitious. But in my opinion, I mean, I'm going to have to support myself. And I don't know whether I'll ever be married or not. So I really have to depend on myself. And I think to be able to get along in this world and support myself, ambition is an important part. Linda Cooper and Mary Bentz belong to a new category of women who've come to life of Georgia. They are women who may make a lifetime career of their work. They want to get ahead. They want good jobs. I feel that all over the South that uh, they, the management positions has always been for the men, that they do not consider women for the management positions in businesses. 
And I think that they have women in the South that are just as capable as men if they were given the opportunity. What about women's lib? Well, I'm not too much for that with what little I know. But I do feel that if a woman is doing the same job that a man is, and she is sitting side by side, I feel like that she should have the same pay. Do you think many women in the company feel the same as you, and as strongly as you? Yes, I do. Shoot it now. Oh, foul. All right, David, make it. Shoot. On weekends, Gerald Paget is the coach of the Scott Boulevard Baptist Church basketball team. So that just gives him a shot. He made that. Then we forget what we're doing. Use our heads now. Think, play calm ball, and we got it. I realize that uh, we just finished another year, and there's certainly been a lot of pressure put on you. On weekdays, Gerald is the manager of the underwriting department at Life of Georgia. He got that job back in 1970 when he was 37 years old. He had had no underwriting experience. I would have much preferred somebody with an underwriting background, even if we would have had to hire some experienced manager from another company. Elmer Thomas. Thank you. He's been at Life of Georgia for 24 years. Now he's chief underwriter for life insurance. Reporting to a man who's never been an underwriter. The manager before Gerald Paget was Wendell Robinson, who was also an underwriter. But he didn't like the job. He didn't like what he had to do. You have to manipulate people. Uh, you have to occasionally take disciplinary action. And I found that these things bothered me tremendously. You know, I would uh, wake up at night thinking about them. Gerald is, he is a real go-getter. He has some uh, attributes which, which I don't have. Uh, if I'd had some of them, uh, who knows? Maybe I would still have been in, in the position of manager. One morning, I think it was about 4 o'clock in the morning, I sat down at my breakfast table at home and wrote a letter to my superiors asking to be relieved as manager of the department. And I requested uh, them to let me remain in the department uh, as an underwriter, and they did this. Did, did Pat Gilman know the people upstairs on the 27th floor knew that Gerald had never been an underwriter, we put it back on, but they made a decision about the kind of man they wanted for manager of the department. Yeah. Gerald had a record of being an organizer, a good administrator, we had a number of people who are good technical underwriters. And uh, we felt this part of it could be carried on by those people. But the moment our greatest need was for a good administrator. Yellow lens glasses. Uh, I think that uh, in the areas we expected him to be strong, he's been strong. He has had some little problem with personnel. And we knew this when we asked him to take the job. Oh, yeah. Certainly, I had some reservations about taking the job. And I knew I would have a lot to learn to uh, try and gain the respect of a lot of people who uh, perhaps were passed over for this job. I think there were certainly at least uh, two or three of the senior underwriters that didn't particularly like the idea. I think I resented it, and I think anybody in my position would have resented it. Gerald didn't know anything about underwriting when he came into, into the department. And for a period of a year or two, it was an extremely difficult situation. We would try to hold him back in certain areas where we knew that he was doing wrong and that the situation that he implemented would not work. But he would go ahead and do them anyway. 
that's sort of embarrassing, I guess, when you receive a telephone call from one of your district managers, a guy who's out in the field away from the home office, and he needs a quick answer to a technical underwriting question. And if you cannot give him the answer right there on the phone, but you have to call someone in, you know, and relate it to them and then discuss it a little bit and then give him the answer, of course, you've tied him up and he's lost some confidence in you, no doubt about it. So that's one pressure I have felt. And I felt the pressure, too, of our people not really wanting change. When they look at me as, as their department manager, with not too much job knowledge, but here I am trying to, to create a change. He's a very smart individual, very intelligent. And that's not saying that we're dumb. He forgets that most of us aren't used to a sudden changes. When you make sudden change, I think it makes people nervous. Like, maybe tomorrow their job won't be there. For the old-timers in the department, it's not so much Gerald, but the times that have changed. The atmosphere, this place, this new building. It's not like the old days anymore, they say. <laughs> a relationship between the people and the departments than there is over here. I like to drink coffee while I'm working, but we can't do it up here. Outside of the people on our floor, you lose contact with people in other departments. Gerald's day is filled with problems. They come in all sizes. The new computers don't work. An agent is upset because the underwriters turned down a policy he sold. People are using the eight telephones on the floor too often for private conversations. Are you all seeing many of them in your team that you know of? Not hardly any that I know of using their account back. Mike Weaver is an underwriter trainee. Gerald Padgett, he's got the power the management decisions of the whole department. The man with the power is the one you're always shooting for, or wanting to be like, or in his spot. He's got the power. Hey, Brian. Upstairs, the 27th floor, where the real power is. The men who judge, Gerald Paget. Certain ages, or marital status, or occupations, so that we can eliminate uh, part of these unnecessary motor vehicle records that we're getting. And uh, we also have learned that the state of Georgia... It's up here that the decisions are made about Gerald that are crucial to his future. Do they give you any notion of how you're doing and what they think about your future? Or is that just a blank up there? No, uh, actually we know how we stand as far as job performance goes. How do you know? Uh, we're told. I can't tell you exactly when it came to my attention first because you get to know people gradually over a period of time, but along the line somewhere I became aware of the fact that he was doing a good job in our claims department. What kind of a timetable is there for a man like Gerald, who's favorably known in the company? There isn't any. We don't treat people according to a schedule, according to a timetable. We don't think that's the way to do it. Gerald moved up fairly rapidly in the beginning. He reached a level and sort of drifted sideways for a little while. He'll determine what his timetable is, not us, really. As Gerald goes back to the 23rd floor, he looks at what he hopes is the future. 
Do you have any limits in your mind as to how high you might go in this company? But to be realistic, uh, I, I would feel like uh, vice president level would, would probably be uh, as high as I could go with this company. Everybody uh, is on his own timetable. He makes his timetable, whatever that is. The office day is ending. Gerald will take work home with him. On his way out of the building, he'll pick up his wife, Dolores. She operates uh, the little card and candy shop downstairs in this building and has been for the last four years. Before they were married, he told her their first son would be named Trey, Gerald III. And we have two boys. Uh, Trey, he, uh, of course, is the third, named after me. And uh, he's 14 years old. And we have uh, another son named Randy. He's 11 years old. I don't know. I guess uh, our lifestyle's not too different from anybody else uh, in, in this type of salary range that I'm in. If you achieve the vice president level in the company, what would that mean to you? But certainly the income would be more. No doubt about that. There would be a, a great deal of prestige. You just feel more important, to, both to yourself, to your family, and to your company. And I can remember uh, the WPA uh, my daddy worked for them. Uh, he, he built bridges and, and uh, drove uh, dump trucks. And uh, he could have took the easy way out, I'm sure, and went into the soup lines or some, uh, uh, perhaps uh, got assistance some other way. He's always worked uh, ever since he was a young boy. And my grandparents, too. They wanted to mount to something. They wanted to possess something, own something. And I feel like this was passed right on to my parents and then from them to me. They are the senior underwriters at Life of Georgia. Eight, nine, ten, eleven, from the middle, and one. They see themselves as special people. We're not on an assembly line operation like the underwriters are. They think it takes five to ten years to make a good underwriter. If they make a mistake, it will cost the company money. If they made too many mistakes, they would lose their jobs. See some of the goals that we first established at the beginning of this year and, and whether or not we achieve these. I think we can pretty much say that we got the new business issue system underway. Bill Overby sometimes feels they're not sufficiently appreciated. I think we should be looked upon as something special. We not might not be equivalent to our actuaries, but I think definitely we should be equivalent to our computer operators or people like that. Lester Bryant is also a senior underwriter. I think anybody with any ambition always feels like that, that they don't get ahead as fast as they, as they feel like they should. And I'm no exception. I think anybody has to have a break to get ahead. Didn't you get a break? I don't think so. Jim York is the youngest senior underwriter in the department. He's 35 years old. He thinks of himself in a jungle of pressure and competition. He worries about failing. 
And I got three brothers. You know, they're all all college graduates. And they all have very good jobs. They all make more money than I do. And I love them all. We get along great. And I don't resent college graduates. But I do feel an inferiority because I have not been as, as successful as they have. Now, you know, I, and I want to prove that uh, maybe, maybe if I just want to come right out and say, man, I want to prove that I'm as good as they are. For two years, Jim York has been promising his wife, Madeline, that he'd take her dancing. I love to dance. Like a lot of times, I'll come in the house and turn the radio on, dance by myself. Am I really? Yeah. She's a tiger. She is, uh, she's a go-getter. She's real, real quick. Everything she does is quick. Thank you. He's 35 and I'm 25 and uh, he has more of the uh, old standard and I'm kind of hip. <laughs> He's trying to make me unhip. <laughs> Jim York and Madeline, who works for a real estate company, are both unhip by some standards. They have very old fashioned feelings about work, success, and what they want to make of their lives. But Madeline has a very modern feeling about her job. I like to work. I'll always work. Because uh, I, I want to be a career woman along with being a mother because one day my children will grow up and I won't have any more little babies. And it gives me something to do. I, I do a lot of rationalizing my mind a lot of times, but nevertheless, it still sticks in my mind that I'm not proud, uh, real proud of the fact that uh, for all practical purposes, she has to work. How do you feel about what he just said? I resent it. <laughs> I really resent it because uh, it's not fair. It's, uh, it bothers me that he feels that way. It always has. It's always, he's always <laughs> made me feel like a heel because he felt so bad about me working. Would it bother you if you made more money than he did? If I want to be honest, it'll, it would change the relationship. It would change the situation. What is your ambition for Jim in terms of his career? I didn't want him to be the president of Life of Georgia necessarily, but uh, I don't want him to settle for second if he can get first. If in 10 years, through no fault of his own or lack of ambition. Jim were exactly where he is now. How would you feel? I would be a little resentful, a little uh, sad that we couldn't have achieved more. And I would have my doubts towards Jim, and I think that that, that would only be normal, that you know, maybe Jim didn't try as hard as he, he could have. I believe that I can, uh, uh, if I work hard enough, and I, I, I sure plan on doing that, I think I certainly can become uh, a chief underwriter. I, I just don't see any reason why I should If you go through all those years, and uh, 20 years down the line, they say, hey, uh, John Doe over here, who came to the company just five years ago, really has the qualifications more than you do. You just wasted 20 years of your life and didn't get to get promoted. Jim York knows that these are crucial years for him. Okay. okay. A time when decisions will be made that will shape the rest of his life. And that these decisions will be made here in the office. Some, some years ago, I was offered a position with a local company. I had a discussion with my wife and family. And, of course, I was offered a quite sizable increase in salary. Uh, we weighed all factors, and at my age, I guess, with the obligations I had and the length of service I had with this company, uh, I just decided to stay with Life of Georgia. Uh, I can look back, and 
I guess always will uh, wonder if I made the right decision. Uh, yes, please. Right, and I'll be ready to go. The grog shop next door to Life of Georgia, where some of the old timers stop in after work. Just a sign. The fundamental thing. They dream of a more peaceful time, the old days. They talk about law and order, about permissiveness, about the breakdown of institutions they were brought up to believe in. Watergate worries them. They don't trust the media. They go to church, they believe in God, they believe in work, but they believe you need luck to get ahead. They think people ought to work. Lately, they've come to feel work ought to be satisfying. It worries them that often it's not. But they work hard, they pay their bills, and they tell themselves it will all come out all right in the end. Ray Bardolph. He wanted to be in aviation. He wanted to be a lawyer. He's worked here almost 19 years. Seven years ago, he had a heart attack. He had to turn over the chief underwriter job to Joe Chatham. Are you married, Ray? No, I'm uh, divorced. And I was married seven years. That's the critical year, they said. Uh, we just drifted apart and finally uh, got a divorce. She wanted a child. That would probably kept the marriage together. Are you lonely? Yes, I get lonely. I don't see All right, start over again, right here. How am I going to push you back, though? I mean, All right, two back. Just two right. straight steps back. All right, come on. Recently, Bill Overby and his wife, Carolyn, have been taking dancing lessons. Well, I didn't think I would enjoy dancing, but they offered this course at the Y, learning the different type dances, the rumba, tango, and the waltz. She likes to go probably more than I. You always go from the basics. Okay. Okay? Come on. What would I like to do when I retire? Well, first of all, I would like to accumulate enough within the next 10, 15 years to possibly retire at an early age. I don't want to work till I'm 65. Kids will be grown then. I'd like to move to Florida, find a nice place, and just do what I please. Just like you walking. The dream of early retirement at 55 with enough money to live the way he wants. Will it happen? Or will Bill Overby spend the next 27 years at the same desk on the 23rd floor? I've seen it lots of uh, younger people who are just really, just really eating their heart out to, uh, to advance, to, uh, to move. And uh, if they make it, uh, then more power to them. I'm real pleased for them. But in my case, I'm I am uh, I'm really glad that uh, that was not the case with me. If in 10 years, through no fault of his own or lack of ambition, Jim were exactly where he is now, how would you feel? I would be a little resentful, a little uh, sad that we couldn't have achieved more. And I would have my doubts towards Jim because I would never know the real answer. Did he stay in that position because that was all that Life of Georgia had to offer, or did, did he not give what he should have given to make the company happy? <laughs>